This morning I had the wonderful opportunity and privilege of speaking with Lani Ali. You know her as the wife of, don't you love that phrase? The wife of Muhammad Ali, of which she is very, very proud to be. But at the same time, she is such a gifted woman in her own right. This morning on the air, I cannot tell you how she connected with those listeners, with the people who called, with the people who sent email, who posted messages on Facebook, all talking about what a hero Muhammad Ali is to them. And to each person, she was able to respond with such graciousness, with such generosity. Now, the one thing I really want you to know before she and I sit down to chat, number one, she and Muhammad Ali have been married since 1986. But, in fact, she met, first laid eyes on Muhammad Ali when she was age six. I wonder if you all knew that. I think that's a pretty good time to introduce yourself to your future husband. But what I really want you to know is that earlier this year, President Obama appointed Lani Ali to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, and in that place, she will serve as an advocate, as a representative for all of us who are searching, who are yearning, who are waiting to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lani Ali. I did, Diane. I had so much fun. I was telling people today when they asked me about the show, a lot of people were listening that I didn't even realize would be listening. But I had a lot of fun in that studio with Diane this morning. And you do such great, a great job of Thank you. PR for me that I may have to hire you for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Now, tell us first how Muhammad is right now. Muhammad's great. I mean, you know, yes, he has Parkinson's disease, he's had it for a while, and he has the same challenges a lot of other people who have PD have on a daily basis, you know, the struggles with movement, and although his biggest struggle is taking his medicine, as usual, he's not one for it, but uh, he's done very well. He, uh, considering how long he's had the disease and the illness, um, like uh, Ron, his illness has not progressed very rapidly. Now you have seen Muhammad most recently mm -hmm. with the walker and really that really had nothing to do with his PD, but he had spinal stenosis. And if anybody knows anything about spinal stenosis, oh, that boy. he had it in his neck. And I will say, Diane, that was a result of his, his boxing career. Um, it looked a little bit like Parkinson's disease, so it sort of confounded his doctors. They didn't know it was spinal stenosis. So once we realized what it was and he had surgery to correct it, um, it has compromised his balance a little bit, and his, so sometimes he's on a walker just to make sure he's safe. But otherwise, he's doing fairly well. I think the reason you mentioned the boxing right. is because so many people in this country continue to believe that Muhammad Ali suffered from Parkinson's because of boxing injuries, I got a um, rather lengthy email after you were on the air this morning, sort of detailing um, the 
diagnoses that Muhammad Ali had received and claiming that doctors had said his Parkinson's was the result of boxing. You say no. Well, the doctors that I know and the doctors who I know who have examined him, and these are Parkinson specialists, motor movement disorder specialists, um, said no. So I don't know who sent the email and how much they know about Muhammad's personal medical history. But, you know, people like, you know, it's, it's sexier exactly. to say it came from boxing, I'm sure. Um, but it really didn't. As Muhammad says to a lot of people, do you know any other boxers with Parkinson's disease? In fact, we believe it came from pesticide poisoning. Where so, would that have come from? His training camp in Pennsylvania. Because it was a lot of log cabins. They'd, you know, back then they sprayed all kind of stuff for bugs, DDT, all kind of things. They put on vegetables and things. And we, they did find pesticides in his, in his blood. So uh, that was before Dr. Fawn found out there were toxins in the blood could lead possibly to PD. So that's what we believe. But, you know, it hasn't never been proven, but we believe it. Not from, let's say it could be an offshoot of his career, though, because he wouldn't have been there had it not been for boxing. Well, uh, yeah. true. Now, you know, so often in these conversations that we've had at the gala each year have focused on the individual who has Parkinson's. And we have never focused on the individual who is the caretaker of one who has Parkinson's. I know that your sister helps you a great deal but can you talk about the role of caretaker? And of course, I am particularly interested right. because my own husband has Parkinson's. Well, uh, Diane, I don't know if you know, know it or not, but I've really sort of become an advocate for caregivers uh, for people with PD because, as you know, whether you're doing it for PD or anyone else, uh, as a caregiver, there's a lot of things that go unnoticed about the caregiver. In fact, Abe Lieberman said to me one time that you know, he'd have patients come into his office and they'd be brought by a certain individual over a period of years and then all of a sudden he'd look up and he'd say, where is so-and-so who used to bring you? Oh, they died. Uh -huh. And the reason that occurs is because caregivers naturally take so much care of the person they're taking care of, they tend to neglect themselves. So I have sort of decided as part of my activism for PD to support the caregiver in what they do and help them bring attention. Yeah, thank you. But really those, those, that applause should be for the caregivers who are out there, the thousands of caregivers who are out there who have delivered that kind of care day in and day out, such as Diane and, and as you know with Mort and a lot of others here tonight um, to those people with PD. Now, does that mean, for example, that you go to each and every physician's appointment that Muhammad has? Yes, I do. I always have, though. So do I. Ah, uh, yes, I have to. Because anybody who knows, most people, even with my mother, who did not have PD, when a patient goes into a doctor's office, very seldom do they give the doctor the entire story. There's a lot of things they may forget, they may minimize, and if it's my husband, he minimizes everything. It wouldn't open his mouth because he, he wants to pretend there's nothing wrong you know, uh, with the doctor because he doesn't want him to prescribe any more meds. But um, it's, I think it's very important for the person with PD or any chronic illness that the caregiver, care partner is there with them not only so that they can communicate and know what the doctor is saying and what they want uh, the protocol to be, but just so that that person knows you're there to support them. You're in it with them. And I think in Muhammad's case, that was extremely important to know that regardless of his condition, that I was going to be there to support him throughout. So I, it's very important, I think, to take him, mm -hmm. you know, to go with him to the doctors. He's very good about it. For a man, he'll go to any doctor. Just don't give him a pill. <laughs> well, and yeah. that's what I was going yeah. to ask about, these meds that oh. he has okay. resisted from the start. 
Yes, he's not a good patient <laughs> in that regard. He's not a good patient. Uh, he has trouble, as I told you this morning, he's always had trouble swallowing pills, and Muhammad's never been a pill popper. He never believed in taking supplements, even when he was boxing. He did it on his own. He ate the nutritious food he thought he, he should be eating, and you know the juices, you know the fresh vegetables and all that. And he never took any vitamins, and he didn't like it. So having to take you know, something like medication, plus you're talking about a man who believes in mind over matter. If anybody saw the thrill in Manila, and you wonder how Muhammad was able to overcome and be the last man standing, it's, man, it's mind over matter. And he really thought that he could sort of confront this illness and beat this illness with just believing in himself and overcoming it on his own. But of course now he knows that he does have to take these medications, as awful as he may think they are. Do you have to ride him? To take those medications? I used to, yeah, well, I used to have to bribe him a lot <laughs> with any and everything. But yeah, now it's, it's not as bad. You know, I do, first set of meds he's pretty good at, second maybe, third, you really have to start getting the ice cream out and the cake and yeah, exactly. everything else, you know. Exactly. I'll give you this if you take, if you take your meds, you can have it, you know. And it's really, you really, you really, it's really sad that you have to do that, but, you know, we have, because he has the trouble with, with the medication of taking pills, we have to dissolve them. And if anybody has ever tasted that concoction of meds, if anybody tastes any concoction of meds, you know it doesn't taste so good. So it's very bitter and nasty. Lonnie, talk a little about your first sighting of Cassius Clay. That's right, he was Cassius Clay at the time. I was six years old, I'd come home from uh, school. I was in grade school, first grade. I went to parochial school, Catholic school. So I came home in my little Catholic girl uniform with the pigtails and we had moved into a neighborhood that was um, occupied by his parents. They lived across the street. I didn't know it at the time. And I came home to find my mother standing in the doorway looking out across the street into his mother's yard, Muhammad's mother's yard. Um, and there was this man sitting on the porch, young guy with a white uh, short sleeve dress shirt, a black bow tie, black dress pants, black shirt, I mean black shoes, black socks, very conservative, conservatively dressed. Thick and span. Very clean. And, um, and we're talking about early 60s, right? Yeah. yeah early 60s. <laughs> and every young boy in the, in the neighborhood, including my own brother, was in front of him, um, you know, just all around him. And actually there's a photograph of that. And all their bikes were in his mother's driveway and she couldn't have gone anywhere had she wanted to. And he spotted me in the door. And he asked the boys there, did they know who I was? And of course my brother chimed up, oh, that's my sister. He said, well, go get her. And that's how I met him. Were you the only girl I was in the, the only crowd? girl, okay. and there is a photograph that memorializes that. Okay. And I was scared to death of the man. So fast forward oh, yeah. to, death. to age what? Depends on what you want to ask. <laughs> Fast forward to about age 17, 18, okay. 19. I was telling Diane today, she said, you know, well, when did you know you were going to marry Muhammad? I said, you know, I was 17 years old. I didn't know it at six. She thought maybe I knew it when I was a little girl. <laughs> no, like I said, I was scared to death of him. But Muhammad became like my mentor, my best friend. But at the age of 17, I knew that I would one day be with Muhammad, you know, end up as his wife. Somehow. And, she, and, and what's interesting with Diane is that she goes, but he had three, three other wives. How'd you know that? Well, I knew him before he had the first wife. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so I knew all of his wives. I knew all of his wives. I knew all of his children. So uh, we had a long history of, you know, and our mothers became vet best friends and mother traveled with his mom. So Muhammad was in and out of my house just like he was in and out of his mother's house. But I'm still wondering, and I thought about this afterwards, whether uh, you might have been intimidated by the fact that Muhammad had had three wives before you. No, I should have been. <laughs> no, because, you know, as I was saying today, Muhammad and I come from very similar backgrounds. Um, I am, all of his other wives came from large cities. I came from Louisville. And 
told Diane Muhammad used to come home and, and physically say to me, you are so square. square. And he would say he would do just that. He goes, but that's OK. Um, but I knew that, you know, at 17, I knew. And it wasn't, you know, I had a lot of things I wanted to do. I pursued my degrees and, you know, worked and did all these things. But I knew one day I would end up with him. But as I told Diane, it was more of an epiphany that I knew. You know, the thought goes through my head. And I knew it was because I would be there in his later years when he would need me. Not that, you know, because Muhammad was always very healthy. So it had nothing to do with that. It's just I knew I would be there to carry, help him carry out his legacy, his work, whatever. One of uh, the things you talked about this morning, as far as his maintaining his health through Parkinson's is exercise. That's true. You know, you think about how long he's had this illness, and we sort of figured out Muhammad probably had early onset. He probably really had it when he was about 39. He wasn't diagnosed until he was about 42, but when you think about having the first physical symptom, which was a tremor in his thumb, he most likely had it prior to that. You know, he had sleep disorders, which now we know is a precursor um, to it. His speech had slurred a little bit, but that they attributed to boxing, so I don't know. But um, when you think back, he's had it such a long time, but we believe maybe the progression has not been as quick in him because, you know, it, it does do different things with different individuals, but perhaps because of his great physical condition and the fact that he continued to exercise and work out for a long period of time, and then even after the spinal stenosis where he had to be in physical therapy for uh, uh, a year, we found out that Muhammad liked being in physical therapy in front of people where he could work out and have an audience, perform. <laughs> so you never have to, I mean, as opposed to taking meds, he always will get up and go to physical therapy because there's always an audience waiting for him. Now, someone else asked whether you've ever tried alternative therapies like acupuncture. He does do acupuncture. Something new that we've discovered in the, a few months prior to our leaving Arizona for the summer, he started taking um, treatment with acupuncture. And, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, acupuncture is like a rubber band. You know, it's very slow. And it just, you know, so he hasn't had enough of it, and he hasn't had it over the summer, so the verdict's still out on that. But I'm always interested in anything that is alternative, that's not invasive, that helps the person, whether it's massage therapy, whether it's dance, whether it's... Uh, like physical therapy, exercise, yoga, Pilates. When I say Pilates to men, they don't know what that is. <laughs> but I mean, all of, and Muhammad won't do it. He says it's girly. But um, <laughs> all of those things, you know, uh, I believe in, um, in, in trying and experimenting with. Because anything that brings quality of life to the person, I think, should be tried. And thinking out of the box about how to do those kinds of things. Now, how much did the two of you? talk together. Now? Mm -hmm. He's very talkative in the mornings. And I have to tell you, it's prior to him getting his dose of meds, his first dose of meds. When he gets up in the morning, Muhammad talks a lot. Um, you know, he tells me whatever it is he thinks he, I, I need to know or he wants to say. After that, it can become very difficult. But uh, I've difficult been with him. Difficult how? It's, you know, it, it affects people in different ways. Where you see Michael, where he speaks very well, Ron speaks very well, Muhammad has real issues with that, with that voice. And maybe part of that is from the strain from yelling all the time when he was boxing. Maybe he injured his vocal cords. But he's at, we have other friends who, has, who have PD that have the same kind of problems, that projection of the voice. So after he takes those first dose of meds, it's hard to get that motor started. And um, it's hard to, to make his voice audible. But I have been with him so long and married to him so long, and I sort of have spoiled him somewhat, that he can, you know, I can look at him and tell by his facial expressions or wherever he's looking, I know what he wants. I can just tell what he wants. And my sister has almost become like that as well. Not a good thing to do because we really need to make him speak. But. And that's the last question about getting help for the caregiver. You are very fortunate. I to am. Have your I sister. am. I'm very fortunate. He has known because she's like family. She is family, I mean for him, because he's known her since she was nine months old. 
So she is like an extension of me. She's the next best thing for me, you know, as for me to be there. She's the next best thing, but not everybody has that. And I face this all the time when I'm out speaking to groups of people with PD and their caregivers of who do they get to come in. And I always tell them the first thing to do when they find out a person has been diagnosed is start building that support group. Mm -hmm. People who can come in and give you, you know, a few hours of rest, respite care, I mean respite uh, time, that you can go out and do things that you want to do to get you away from, physically away from the caregiving role because mentally it's very difficult to get away from it. I'm here tonight on this stage, everybody sees me, but my mind, half of my mind is still in Louisville with my yeah. husband. And, and it's, just, it's just a fact of life. You learn to deal with it, it's just the way it is. You never really leave them mentally. But you do need to find and do, you know, pursue your own passions and keep your life because you have a life too and it's very important that the caregiver do that. As you know, Diane, next month, November, has been designated by the President as National Caregiver Month. So I would urge each and every one of you out there who is a caregiver, care partner, to try and do something special for you. Um, you know, whatever that is, if you have to plan a little bit longer to make it happen, but do something special for you. It's very important that you take care of yourself and that you do the same kinds of things for yourself that you would do for the person you're taking care of. And one final question on the Presidential Commission. Please talk about that. Now, I have to correct Diane a little bit. I'm not there as an advocate for stem cell research or anything of that nature. That's not my role. It's really to evaluate different issues that come up, bioethical issues that come up. Um, or uh, topics we would like to discuss that the, that the chair would want to discuss, or the president has, has put a charge in front of us, which he has. So that's what we're doing now. But I, you know, I, ha I can't be there to evaluate, or per I should say to be an advocate for my own purposes. That's I not my role. I think it was wishful thinking on Yeah, I, I can't do that. You know, I have my own thoughts, but I have to evaluate, evaluate what's good for the public, the public good. So what's good for everyone. What a pleasure. To well, talk thank you. With you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Me. I'm glad to have been here. Thank you.